My guest today is Will Roosh. He's a high school teacher in L.A. who's having to deal with the current state of American education and all its flaws. He hosts a podcast called Cylinder Radio, where he basically just enjoys talking to people who challenge his critical thinking. He also brought up an organization I wasn't aware of called the Heterodox Academy. Their homepage really sums up what I've found to be his teaching philosophy, which is diverse viewpoints and open inquiry are critical to learning. It doesn't get much more straightforward than that. So as I've followed him over the past year or so, it's been encouraging to me to see that there do exist teachers out there who share this philosophy that are doing everything that they can on the teacher's side of public education, as irredeemable as taxpayer-funded education may be. So Will actually acknowledges all this. He won't deny any of it, and he's in it anyway. So I found him to be just a fascinating guy, and I really think he's worth your attention. Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8. See, I have taught you statutes and rules, as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? My name's Adam Terrell, and I'm here to encourage you to obey the law and think about it and speak about it constantly. I broke the law. Christ paid my debt by sacrificing himself so that I can be clean to offer myself as a living sacrifice back to God. The entire Mosaic law is obligatory for everyone. Keeping some of the laws look different today because the light of further revelation supersedes shadows in the old law. The temple sacrifices are an example where we have something better. Note that we must still obey the Mosaic laws for sacrifices. There is still a temple, and priests are still required to offer sacrifices. It's just that the priests, the sacrifices, and the temple are all better now. God will show grace to those who apply the law to themselves, to those who have hidden the law in their hearts, and he will judge those who disobey accordingly. I must apply it to myself, and then those around me will see its fruit and be drawn to its goodness. Theocracy grows by the sword of the Spirit, God's word, and self-sacrifice. The law's purpose is to give a path to restoration. Christ has restored me, so I must seek to restore others by sacrificing myself. Thanks for listening. My goal with each conversation is to edify and bring the law and wisdom to bear on each person's current situation in life. So I was actually just in the middle of listening to your last podcast about uh, street epistemology. It was very interesting. Oh, yeah. About halfway through it. Yeah, it was a big one. So, um, <laughs> yeah, messed with my head a little bit. You were just sort of getting into your background a little bit there. Um, you said you grew up Democrat, and then eventually you encountered some nice Republicans and not so nice Democrats, and y y your sort of journey there. Um, so give me a little bit of background about how you were raised. I'm from, like, eastern Pennsylvania. So it was very middle America. We had, like, a collie. Like, like we, it was white picket fence, two-story house. My dad worked for the local steel, um, steel mill uh, in, like, corporate. My mom was a preschool teacher and then later a social worker. And it's just my whole family tree was just very waspy. That's the best way I can explain it. We weren't rich, but we weren't poor. We were really like middle class. Like we lived paycheck to paycheck, but we always had a paycheck ready for the mortgage and we could go on vacation every year. And it was just to the Jersey Shore, but it was like it was like a very just normal American life. And that's just how I thought everyone lived, basically. Right. You don't have any other experience to go by. You just All right. function. <laughs> yeah. 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 So what was that turning point? Um, and, um, actually, before I, before I ask about that, um, you're a – let me get a little bit of background about where you are currently. So you're a, you're a school teacher. Is that correct? I am. Yeah. I've been teaching in L.A. for 15 years. Yeah. Okay. What is that like? with thinking the way that you do about education? Uh, it's, it's tricky. I, uh, I taught in public school in kind of challenging areas of LA in the North Valley and then in East LA for about, about a total of six or seven years. 
And then I went to a private school and I'm at a private school that just in the culture of the school and the community, they are very much, they're very supportive of the, the educational endeavor of leaving no stone unturned. So I can challenge a lot of stuff in the name of education and they support it. I, I do though, keep my social media, my podcast, everything like that separate. I don't talk about it. The kids know and the teachers know, but like they don't, I try to keep it as separate as possible. I don't talk about where I teach at and things like that. Cause it get, does get a little tricky because I am very critical and I try not to talk about the specific institution I work at, but I have experience teaching all kinds of kids. I teach like billionaires, kids and like, actors and then i've taught homeless kids who lived under you know un, slept under an overpass you know and they came into school the next day so i think that gives me a nice wide range of understanding what the positives and negatives of the educational system are regular school charter school public private rich poor kind of all of that kind of stuff and, and i love it i it's it's very nice to be able to find your as corny as it sounds find your calling and i i am I'm unquestionably I found that in some form of, of education. I love it. Well, what I've seen of you on your Instagram, you're, you're a very passionate guy. You're very uh, energetic about this way of thinking. And I've, I've always taken very kindly to that. You have a very positive attitude and a very winsome way of thinking. And I appreciate that a lot. Thank you. Thank you. How did you find me? I think when I was starting this podcast, maybe eight months or a year ago, uh, I put out a call for anybody that was following me or list, looking at my stories to recommend somebody to that would be interesting to interview. Um, and a guy, I can't remember his name, but I think his account is called withoutrulers.co. Okay, yeah. So he actually recommended, and I think I followed you probably six or eight months ago, and I've just sort of been watching for a while, and I think we've interacted maybe a couple of times. Yeah. Um, and I, I really liked what I saw. It was very interesting um, not a lot of people in my circles um, have much to do with public schools. And so I thought this would be a really interesting opportunity to sort of explore what that world has been like. Uh, I'd be happy to. I mean, I mean, it just, it, I'm not being, you know, um, like weird here, like blowing smoke up your butt. Like I it really means a lot that to everyone who follows and interacts with this thing. Cause I feel weird You say I'm energetic. Like, I feel weird talking into my phone. Like it's, it's weird to, to, or give advice or any of that stuff that I do, but I, I think of it like it's my classroom. I don't feel weird in front of the classroom. So I have to force myself to do it into my phone. And I think about it like it's my classroom and, um, I kind of get over it, but it, it's really awesome to, to get any kind of traction in what I'm doing. Cause I, yeah, I do believe in it. Yeah. Well, and the whole thing of your podcast is the cylinder radio. It's, you know, it's the classic story for those who, who are listening that don't know. It's the three men that see a cylinder from different angles. And one says, oh, it's a square. And the other one says, no, it's a circle. And this other person says, no, it's a three-dimensional object. It's a cylinder. Yeah. Depends on which way yeah. you look at it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's – so getting back to, like, my story is when I moved out to California, um, I, I met – the biggest thing probably was meeting my wife, who's, a, like, Filipino immigrant um, – just immigrant mentality, just very, just polar opposites and everything. As far as like, they didn't have money, immigrant mentality, um, more like pick yourself up by your bootstraps person, not big on like big government, social welfare. I mean, they, her parents were under Marcos, so they know a dictator. So when they hear people hmm. knock Trump as a dictator, they're like, well, <laughs> you know, like they have, they just have a different point of view, you know? And that was the start of it. And then it just became this, this just avalanche. I found Joe Rogan's podcast probably. And he introduced me to all the, like, the intellectual dark web people. And that just kind of just became like just a one thing after another, after another. And then I didn't know up from down, which was really tough at like 30, whatever, five years old in my life to like really take everything you thought was true and say, maybe it's not that clear cut. Mm. So what was the, what spurred the move to you uh, for you to go to LA from Pennsylvania? Uh, I don't know. I think I, I was, there was something in me to be this guy, like where I wanted something better. One of my buddies came out here to do, pursue stand up comedy. And I came out for like a spring break and I was, this is incredible. We got in his car and drove from like, like the border, went to Tijuana for one night and then like drove all the way up PCH all the way up to like big Sur, playing grateful dead. And like, you know, drinking rum, smoking pot or whatever we were doing. It's like, you know, 21 year olds. And, uh, and I was like, this place is incredible. 
And it just hit him, hit me like, oh, people can just move here. Like it's not off limits, you know, but no one's ever done that. Like in my direct circle, but he did. And I was like, okay, well I can come out. I'll give it a shot. So I don't know. I, don't know. I think there was just something in me that was calling for something different. Hmm. Yeah. So how did you meet your wife? How long have y'all been married now? Uh, married in 2012, met in 2010. So it's been 10 years. Um, I met on like a really cheap, corny, um, online dating site. I was dating a lot of people just like, I was just trying to like, you know, fish with a wide net. So I got really interested in meeting, I think again, coming from that world where all the girls were kind of the same, all the people were kind of the same. I saw an opportunity like, wow, I can date people who are different cultures and different everything, you know? So I tried to date like whatever it would be like, you know, like black girls or Asian girls or Indian girls and just like all this kind of stuff. And like, not, not necessarily being intimate with everybody, but just like, just getting to know people. I got, I really started to have an interest. I got over the fear of getting rejected and started just having an interest in like learning about people. Like I can have a dinner with someone and be truly curious about them. And that was an enjoyable experience. And obviously most of them didn't work out. You know, so I was, I saw it as like, I'll just try online. I'll meet people out when I'm, when I'm at a bar, I'll just kind of meet as many people as possible. And again, this isn't like me being a player. It was really just a, a me trying to meet people. Right. Just sort of everything is new and there's so many different yeah. points of view out there and just being fascinated by all that. Yeah. It was exciting. Yeah. Getting back to your, there was a, there was a quote that you had from your, uh, from your podcast that was really interesting. Um, hmm. You said, uh, st- is stealing curiosity from children and not facilitating deep dives is, is really yeah. damaging. Do you feel like that's the way that you were raised and that's why you're so passionate about changing the way, th- uh, children grow up to think critically? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't remember school at all. I remember the social aspects. All I was thinking about in school was trying to find good friends that I could trust and, you know, that were loyal and could have fun with trying to find a girl that would like me and trying to like not be a weirdo. Like, that's all I remember. I don't remember like actually enjoying learning, which is so strange because learning is awesome. And it's, it was, I, you know, people have asked me cause I've been in this career for a while and they say that, you know, even when I started, they were like, Oh, you really love what you do. How did you find this? And I didn't have a good answer until recently, which was learning is fun. Like it's fun to be capable. It's fun to learn. It's fun to, you know, to highlight things that you don't know about. We all love learning. We go on those YouTube deep dives all the time, but yet we hate school, which is supposed to be all learning. So where is there a disconnect? There's clearly a disconnect here between what we love to do and what it, this institution that's designed to do that. So I think that's exactly what it was. I think I was like, if this can be done better and I'm not you know, an egghead. I wasn't really good at school. I'm not that smart in a lot of ways that you can measure being intelligent. And I was like, maybe I'm just seeing something that these people aren't. Because some people, you sit them down, you say, copy this that's on the board. And they go, okay. And you say, do this on a test. And they go, okay. And I'm just not. Like, I'm not going to learn something unless it's connected to this is going to help me in some way. Mm. But that might be a, that might be a, a bad thing for some, for some people or might see it as like a fault. But I don't. I see it as a strength. I can see it as I'm seeing something that a lot of these other teachers, a lot of people in my profession were great at school. And I think that that's caused a lot of blind spots. Right. Yeah. You were like in that podcast, well, what's the worst case scenario if you start to question why something and mm-hmm. you find out you're wrong? Well, then you change your ideas and now you think better. What's, what's so scary about that? Or, uh, I think what a lot of people have possibly never experienced is they start to question something they have and they find out I can't prove my idea wrong Mm -hmm. and nobody else can either. So in that case, I'm, I'm more confident in my ideas than I was before. And that's very comforting. That's a great thing. Yeah. I mean, if you just, if you're actually trying to prove yourself wrong, you can't, you're like, you might be onto something that's pretty good. And I, that's why I love putting part of what I use the, the podcast for and my social media is putting out these ideas. And then when someone's like, I don't think so, I would go right to those comments. I'm like, Oh, why? Yeah. Why? Cause I'm, I mean, if I'm wrong, like, cool, let's streamline this. I don't, I don't want a bad idea longer than I can. One of the things that Reed said though, when I brought that up that I think is so true is he said, well, we're tribal. You could, the worst that could happen is you get ousted from your group. Yeah. Fear of right? loneliness. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that's real. 
you know so if you you know if you belong you're deeply active in your church and you do a deep dive you decide to become an atheist well now that's not your community anymore or vice versa i think the other way works too i think there's a lot of atheists that if all of a sudden they find god then the atheist groups won't want you anymore so there's a lot of i think that's the fear that people might not be aware of what do you yeah. think? I think I think that's exactly right because it basically yeah. means that you're going to have to let some of your friendships that you've probably put a lot of time and effort into, you basically have to say, well, I'm going to have to let those go because they're not as productive as I as they used to be for me because my thinking has changed. And mm -hmm. and not only that, now you're going to have to go out and build a whole lot of new relationships and then what if what if my ideas change again? And I'm going to like, I'm never going to be able to go super deep with anybody until I think you find a community of people that think that are, that are open to and not hostile to new ideas and are very comfortable. And so that sort of becomes your community, which maybe that's what this is, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's the, <laughs> we don't necessarily have to agree on anything. And I think that's one thing that I've struggled with. And it sounds like you have as well. Um, how do you how do you still become a, a winsome enough person to disagree with somebody on something extremely serious and very divisive, but still uh, have that depth of character to not burn all of those relationships and figure out everybody, even there's a reason that there, somebody has a bad idea. Uh, yeah. There is something that drew them to that. And it's a lot of times I find it's because they currently hold a bad idea because they used to hold a worse idea. Right. And so their ideas are slowly improving, but then for whatever reason they've stopped for on, on a particular subject. So it's like they've yeah. stopped growing basically. Yeah, I see that. And also I think that there's just psychological differences, you know, I mean, we're just, we're different personalities and stories are going to resonate with someone. Um, one person different than they might with me you know, someone who's more logic based or someone who's more emotional based, like they just hit us differently. So we have to recognize that. And if someone has a, an idea that we think is bad, like we don't have to agree with the idea, but I think we do have to agree that they believe it, you know, and like, and that's real to them. Like perception is reality and we can still love people through that process of, yeah, you might be off, but your intention is good. And I, you know, I might never change your mind, but it's not about that. You know, your intention is good. And maybe with that good intention, some good will come from it and just not getting so hung up on that. I have a plaque up on my, I have a whole bunch of things. My whole room is just littered with like quotes and pictures and stuff like that. And um, one of them is stop looking at how people and things are different and start looking at how they're the same. Mm. You know, just like look for that common thread that we all have. You know, we all have shared values. We all have things in common. If we start highlighting how we're all different and divisive, then that's easy. That's so easy to do. That's why all this divisive politics stuff I, I get so frustrated with. It's like, that's so easy. Like, look at how we're all the same. Look at our shared values, and then we can move forward with something more positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's been really helpful in my talking to people because there are there are a lot of people that, I would disagree with on something and some people are very interested in opening and talking about it because of where they're at and other people they're they sort of just came to that new idea and they sort of need some time to digest and think through the new position that they just came to before they'd be searching for a new bit of information they're sort of like I'm going to hang on to this for a minute and I'm going to see the results that this gives me and it takes time and um, I think it's important to allow people that time without making them feel like uh, they're going to die tomorrow if they don't change their ideas right now. Giving yeah. people that space. Yeah, it's scary. I just think it's, it's such a good time because we have access to all different ideas and data and stories and all that kind of stuff. You just have to be willing to seek it out. You know, I, I don't know where I heard it. I heard somewhere someone who is very anti-Trump person. And they said, you know what? I'm going to a Trump rally. And they went to a Trump rally and they said, wow, it wasn't what I thought it was. They're like, I still don't like the guy. I still am not a Trump supporter, but I understand it better now. But how many people would do that? Or how many, you know, like red hat MAGA people would go to a Bernie Sanders rally, you know, with like, with a genuine sense of curiosity, not going for material, but just a real sense of curiosity. I just, I just think that that would just be a good way to do it, but you have to be willing to do it. You have to be willing to, 
to challenge those ideas and be curious and be open-minded. And I don't know people just don't want to. Have you ever seen an old movie called 12 Angry Men? Uh, yes. It was a while ago about the jurors. Yes. Yeah. Uh, somebody posted a, this was a few years ago, but I just recently found it. Somebody posted a review about that movie and was commenting on how valuable of a teaching tool it is for um, how to debate with a purpose. Hmm. And the main character in that movie, they basically showed the reason that he was able to change people's minds is that he took every opportunity that he could to agree with somebody, even if they were actively trying to prove him wrong. He would he would do that and he was also open to if somebody makes a good point that looks bad for him you, he had to acknowledge it and he did at every turn and that made people go okay this so this guy isn't just here to disagree with me because he doesn't right. like the way that I'm voting he's here to help me reason things out he's a sounding board he's here to help me mm -hmm. think through stuff and that really helps people open up I think uh, at least in my experience yeah, I'm actually halfway through the book by Chris Voss called Never Split the Difference. He's like the top FBI mm -hmm. um, yeah, hostage negotiator. And it's a lot of that stuff, mirroring and, you know, like the, the tone that you use and, you know, the way you communicate them and find humanity in the person you're trying to talk to. And these are terrorists, a lot of them, you know, and yeah, I think that's that's important. People want to feel understood and want to feel heard. You can't just go right after them and and. And, and and show how you're different. You got to start with something. I love that. Um, I posted about it, I think, the book, the Peter Bogosian and James Lindsay book, um, How to Have Impossible Conversations, is also really great. Um, That's a great book title. It's a, yeah, it's, it, I mean, it's very much like, I mean, Peter Bogosian is the guy who started the whole street epistemology thing. So he's, you know, and he's excellent at just asking questions and really feeling like, okay, this person thinks this sincerely. And even if they think an idiotic thing, it's like, oh, well, they really believe this. Okay. And then just be cur really curious. Like, why do you believe this thing? That's so crazy. You know, if someone says they're, that they're a flat earther. It's hard to go, to be genuinely <laughs> curious. Like, please bring me in on this. Like, why, why do you think this way? And, but like, you can tell when it's genuine curiosity and when it's not, mm -hmm. but I think people can tell. So if you can be really curious, but I think that's, fascinated if you really believe that i'm fascinated and I'm, I'm getting to the point now after doing this for a couple of years where like i'm more curious than i just want to call them an idiot which is nice <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think the flat earthers thing a lot of their motivation is probably just um uh, well it i actually i think i could agree with them on the fact that they want to question things that people think they know for certain yeah and you can at least compliment them on that that attitude <laughs> if nothing else yeah. So that's a, yeah, it's fine. Find the honorableness and be quick to point that out in somebody that you disagree with. And I think that can, that can open some really interesting doors. Uh, so let me ask you a question. If you weren't teaching, what, what do you think that you would be doing if you weren't teaching? I think I'd be teaching. I think, <laughs> I, I think I really, I just, I can't picture myself. I think like I would be, if I'm not teaching in the classroom, I'd be teaching jujitsu or I'd be teaching, you know, uh, some sort of I'd be teaching how to rock climb or kayak or something. Those things I don't even do. Like I just I love I love the the, the pursuit, and I, I really like work with young people. It's I have like a fear of public speaking, um, but I don't in front of young people. And it's it's whenever I say that to my students, like, what are you talking about? You're talking in front of us all the time, and there's blah blah blah. blah. And I realized what it was just really recently. I said, what it is is if I screw up. Teenagers are brutal. They're, they, they pick you apart, right? So a lot of people are more scared in front of teenagers than adults because they'll, they'll pick you apart. They'll make fun of everything. You have something in your teeth or whatever, a pee stain on your pants. But they're also way more forgiving. If you show vulnerability because they're in such a vulnerable place in their life that they will respect that. And that's what I found. And that's what I finally just hit this like maybe a couple of weeks ago because kids were asking. I didn't have a good answer. And it's because... If I do screw up public speaking, which is, I guess, the fear of public speaking, then I can just be open about my screw up and they go, oh, well, we're 16 years old. We screw up all the time. It's nice to see you owning your screw up and you being vulnerable and you being, you know, like a little like bearing yourself as like as being a screw up in this instance and, you know, being sad about it. And we'll respect that and they'll be cool with it. So 
um, in some way I would, I would be doing that. Any other pursuit would be something like, you know, I'd like cars, so maybe something automotive, but I don't think I would be very fulfilled if it was a selfish pursuit. In that way. <laughs> yeah. Really to use not. a pop culture just reference, the, the frozen two movie that just came out, it's like the Olaf song about, you know, as soon as I get older, I'll, everything will make sense and I won't have any more questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, isn't that, isn't that funny how it's like the opposite? <laughs> right. Right. The only, if you choose it to be the older you get, like the, that Terrence McKenna quote, you know, bonfires of knowledge, just shine light on all this other stuff you're ignorant to. You're like, oh man, I have all this other stuff to learn now. It was so much easier when I had a simple ideology. <laughs> right, right. So what would you say, you mentioned your calling earlier, what would you say that that is? And how do you measure your success towards your goal? I only came like online two years ago. So this is all very new. I was like in the classroom for a long time. My wife is social media marketing. So she's like, put your classroom online. Go to, I'm tired of hearing about how your lessons are so great. Like talk about it to everyone. And it's, you know, so it's all new. So I don't know really. Um, but teaching is a long, it's, it's, you're in it for the long game. So when people win like, you know, greatest teacher awards and stuff like that, I think that's great. I'm not hating on it and I'll take those awards, but it's not, who knows? Like a kid comes and tells me, you know, you're my favorite teacher. That's nice. I want a 35 year old to come up to me. Hey, I had you, you know, 20 years ago and you helped me to get to where I'm at. Even if it's just a sliver. I'd rather take 1% of the 35 year old pie than like 80% of the 16 year old pie. I think I'm just, I'm in this for the long haul of helping people to live meaningful lives. And it sounds very benevolent and I'm this great guy or I could frame it that way, but it's not, it's, 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 it's very much like this is the way that I think is the best way to structure your life is some way to serve others. I think it's going to serve me better. It gives me meaning and purpose. I can't die because people are counting on me. I feel like I got to do something. It's very self-serving too. It's, it's a nice little way that this world works out. If that makes sense. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, the only way to keep on, the only way to uh, reap anything is you have to sow first. It feels that way. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's by design. It's like, it's the way that life works in order to, in order to produce anything you have to first give. And it, it just, it just comes back so much more. Like when, when I, I have had that, I've had students who graduated a couple of years ago and say like, Hey, this really helped me. Or, you know, I remember this still to this day and it helped me get to here and this bubble. It's like that. I mean, that is such fuel. It's really just like fuel that you can't really quantify the same way that you can monetarily or something like that. It's just, it's a, it's a really a different kind of currency that you're going for. But I think there's a side part of this that I'm trying to figure out how does this scale? How does this monetize? How do we get great teachers, whatever that looks like? It might look like me in some way, but there's a lot of great teachers out there that do a lot of things that how, what would that look like? How would we incentivize this through, through like a free market idea? I don't know because right now the way that you tell a good teacher is through test scores and that's clearly not the way to do it. So it's a, it's a hard problem to solve, but that's kind of the problem that I'm, that I'm taking on is how to make a better school system. And maybe that's not even brick and mortar. Maybe that's online. Maybe that's, I don't know what that is, but that's essentially the, the tall order that I'm taking on. Well, I think everybody thinks of Harvard and Yale as the top the top schools because of the results that they churn out. So I think that they could be onto something there in terms of how successful do your students become in life after they've been through and be, been taught by these people. Yeah, but even that, and that, thank you for bringing that up. Like, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the book by, uh, by William Dereichowitz. I had him on the podcast really called Excellent Sheep. I'm not familiar. He was a professor at Yale. And he talks about how these universities like Yale, Harvard, et cetera, Stanford, they churn out excellent sheep. That they're, they're making people who have come out, um, have golden handcuffs to get it. Most of them get a job in finance or something golden like that. Golden handcuffs. The, the, That's a very interesting way to put uh -huh. it. <laughs> the the antidepressant use is high. The anti-anxiety use is high. The depression rates are high. Like the, they are successful but they're successful almost the same way like they were successful to get there, which is standardized tests and grade point average. Hmm. Successful is different. Again, a kid comes up to me. Hey, Mr. Roosh, you know, I'm working at, at uh, 
you know, Goldman Sachs and I have this, check out my Bentley. That's one thing. But another kid says, Hey, you know, I have a plumbing business and here's my wife and kids. And I get to, I haven't missed a single kid baseball game. And I just love my life in a real way. I have a hobby. I have a side business. I have, you know, I have a hobby that makes me money. I have a hobby that, that stimulates my mind and I paint on the weekends. I have a hobby that, um, you know, extra, that gives me exercise, like all this kind of stuff, like a fulfilled life way better than a miserable kid with a Bentley. So again, it just it makes another wrinkle of like, how do we measure that fulfilledness and purpose in life is really hard to measure. But that's if that's the goal of education, we got to find some way to to get there. Yeah, I think you definitely hit on it because there are a lot of people that may be particularly rich, but either they have a lot of enemies or they hate what they do oh, or they, yeah. they're not married. They don't have any kids and they would like, you know, they're 45 years old and they're finally realize, oh, I wish I had gotten married a long time ago. <laughs> I use Anthony Bourdain. I mean, this guy, for all like quantifiable measures, he had the best life in the world. He traveled the world, ate awesome food with awesome people and made millions of dollars and was loved. And he killed himself. So, like, I mean, he's just one person. Who knows what kind of demons he was fighting? But that is, that it seems like a common story that there's a lot of people that have every quantifiable measure. But if you have all of those metrics and you're not happy now, that what's more depressing than that? Because at least when you're poor, you can be like, ah, if I just get some money. But if you have everything you want and you are successful by every metric that school has ever told you, or society ever told you, and you're still not fulfilled, now you're really in trouble. And I think, I think that's an element that we need to recognize. There was a book that my brother gave me. It's a booklet, but there's an audio booklet as well. It's by a guy named Grant Cardone. Yeah. He's a, a are you familiar with Grant? I am. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He, there was a booklet. There was a booklet called the millionaire booklet. And he said, if you've ever thought to yourself, I don't want to be a millionaire because I don't, I'm happy with a whole lot less money. And he said, if you have the opportunity to be a millionaire and you decide not to because you don't feel like you would need that much money or it would make you um, a bad person or look down upon, he said, be careful that that's not a selfish thought because he said, mm. all the money that you make that's more than what you need is not for you. That's for you to continually invest and repeat the process and yeah. help other people with. And that was that was probably the most eye opening thing that I've ever heard a, a multi millionaire say, and it was really humbling because it was like, are there opportunities that I'm missing to help people, and then I can take the resources that I gain from that and then go repeat that and help more people with it. That's that's great, and that's another thing that I learned. So m growing up, my dad always mowed our lawn, and he's like, no one's he's like, you know. It didn't say it, but essentially like a man mows his own lawn and works on his own car and all that kind of stuff. We don't hire a cleaning lady. We clean up things ourselves. You know, don't force someone to do that for you. And I was, so it's framed of like, yeah, I'm not going to be, you know, elitist and force someone to mow my lawn for me until I, and my, my wife's family, they came here. They didn't have anything. They worked real hard um, and they started a small business and they hired people. And once I discovered that a landscaper need, has a family that he needs to provide for. And if I work a little bit harder doing what I do, it's not, uh, it's not a, a, a negative to have him mow, cut your lawn. It's actually a kind thing. The greatest form of charity is a job. And that was like, oh my, like the idea that we have, um, that like, you, if you have a butler, it might not be a luxury. People are, because we have a, um, a, a live-in nanny and she's family and she's amazing and we love her to death. But, you know, my friends from back home always be like, oh, just do you have your, you know, housekeeper do this and that for you. It's like, is it a luxury? Yes, it is. And we have to pay her. And like, you know, my wife has a small business. And like, if, if that phone doesn't ring and that money doesn't come in, like that's, it's just taking on another kid. There's a lot of responsibility. My wife's business has 12 employees, you know, and every two weeks, you got to crank out that money. Like that is immense pressure. People look at like, and that's, so that just changed my whole perspective on like, business owners, millionaires, corporations, all this kind of stuff. There's gross stuff that happens in corporations, crony capitalism, all that stuff I'm critical of. And it's not always that easy that rich people have it. If you're doing it right, if you're a kind person who's trying to help people, you got to 
you know, that's, that's where that, that's where that money goes is to help people. And, and it's your responsibility to do so. And, you know, if whatever I'm doing, would ever grow to the point where I can start um, hiring people for it, which, you know, someday maybe it could, I would want to try and model like, this is how you should, what you should do with, with wealth or with money. And I think that we need more of that. We need to see that process. That's a really awesome thing that Grant Cardone wrote. And I think it's a good way to frame it like, Oh, I'm going to work harder, not so I can get a, a Breitling watch, but so I can maybe get this guy to provide for his family, get him off the government dole, something like that. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Very much so. So you mentioned something earlier about trying to, well, and then also this connected with your wife saying that you should like stream your, your classroom stuff and put mm -hmm. that online. How do you turn that into a positive to work and help more people than are just in your classroom? Have you, you, you mentioned that you had thought about that. Um, well, right now, just like my Instagram is kind of where I'm testing out ideas and stuff like that. Of, um, I watched the Mr. Rogers documentary. I keep telling the story, but like I watched the Mr. Rogers documentary and he, in the 1960s, was watching TV and he goes, what a beautiful tool, just pumping information right into the, the home. And then he was watching children's television and he was like, this is horrible. It's just people fighting and blowing things up and hitting each other. And he's like, the, why are we using this wonderful tool for such negativity? I want to do something better. And he became Mr. Rogers. But I saw social media and it's a lot of just grossness. It's a lot of flashing and baller stuff and just nonsense, you know, you know, you know, pranks and stuff like that. And it's entertaining and that's great. And TV should be entertaining too. But what would good education look like online? And not education because not taking school and putting it on there because school sucks. So I'm not, I don't want to sit up there like Khan Academy and do that because no one would watch that over someone making like a, you know, a shampoo bomb or something in their friend's house. So how do you give someone something beneficial? And maybe it is a little bit like um, Tony Robbins ish. And I, I don't like that, that self-development stuff, but I don't, I'm playing with it. So I don't know, but that's essentially what I'm trying to do. Instead of reaching whatever, 20 kids per classroom, 25 kids per classroom, four or five classes, hundred ish kids, you know, I have what, like 1500 people. And most of them, I mean, a decent chunk of them, even though they might not comment and stuff like they're pretty active. Like I have a couple hundred people who watch my stories and stuff like that. A couple hundred is far more than I have just in my classroom. And I mean, maybe 10% are like former students or students or people I know in real life. So I've had people reach out to me, 16 year olds from, you know, North Dakota or, you know, teachers from Georgia who are like, oh, I took one of your, you know, memes or whatever and put it in my classroom. Like, I think it's happening somewhere. Like, I think good ideas, there's a market for good ideas with technology. So I don't know, Adam, I'm figuring it out, you know, and just having conversation with you and, and putting as much out there as I can. That's something that I have thought about recently in terms of, well, how do you, you know, if you need your lawn mode or a landscaper to come out and do stuff, that was a very interesting thought that you had. Because if you do it all yourself, it might take you a whole lot more work and it would probably it would potentially be more efficient if you had somebody else do that. But you wouldn't have somebody else do that until you realize that you weren't that great at it. Hmm. There's real power in admitting your weaknesses and things that you can't do because then other people, that becomes their strength and their opportunity in order to help. And somebody might think, well, that's demeaning because now they're having to help you when they could be doing stuff out on their own. But I actually think it's, it's more valuable to do things for other people than it is to do things for yourself on the whole because there are things that you need done that other people are better at than you are haircuts yeah. or, yeah. you know, those kinds of things. So I think, I think the the real path probably for you in order to, to get your ideas forward and to help more people think critically would, would be to um, set a, set some kind of goal. Like we had talked about, about, you know, I want to have, my goal is, I want to have 500 students by the time they're age 35 that mm -hmm. they have reached out to me. And that's what I'm going to shoot for. And, or, or, or set a much larger number than that 500. Set something that's beyond your own ability to do. 
Yeah. And then when you set set a goal that's beyond your own ability, you have to be willing and would be very thankful for somebody coming in and say, wow, that's an amazing goal. Like, you know, Elon Musk, he wants to go to the moon. He wants to make all these yeah. new cars. And it's because he thinks big that when somebody approaches him, some engineer with a design, he's like, this is fantastic. They would never have approached him, I don't think, if he hadn't have set his goals for the moon, li- literally and figuratively speaking. So I'm wondering maybe if that's some sort of a path that you could take, is set your goals higher than you could then you could accomplish on your own and see what happens. Yeah. I mean, Adam, I love it. And um, so that's what essentially I'm putting out here and everyone that follows my um, stuff that I'm doing, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not about me. It's about let's change the educational system. Absolutely. That's, that's the goal is let's change the educational system. And it's so interesting. The kind of people that I get, it's all over the political spectrum. It's all different ages, but it's people who, want to change the educational system and it's not about me doing it but it's about let's do this together and you know i don't know how to code to go with like what you're saying so but there are coders who do so if i come up with some sort of you know like program that we would need to do you know i can hey who knows how to code that we can do this and then they'll code it who knows how to market that we can do this okay let's do it hey what, do we, what about like um, physical fitness how they get some physical fitness people like you know, I, I, someday I might do, you know, some sort of like a, not convention, but whatever that is, some sort of like live event with like test some ideas and I can reach out for a whole bunch of different people. And you're excellent in this, you're excellent in this people from my podcast. That's part of what the podcast is, is you start to make these connections. And I have such talented people. I don't know if you listen to Sydney Smith, my, my buddy, who's the, the Ironman triathlete, he has no legs does the iron man like just incredible awesome just badass dude and he uh, and like he's someone that if i would ever have like a live event to talk to people about making positive change like he's there because he he uh, he can talk about things that i can't you know i mean there's so many connections that um, everyone has something that they're great at you know my thing is i'm able to explain complicated things simply that's really all i'm that's like the thing that i'm i'm good at and I'm, I'll put myself as being as good at that or better than, than most people. But I'm not as good or better than most people at most things. So that's what's so cool is I'm forming this alliance. And everyone that's following my content is, is in it to some degree. They, they kind of get what I'm doing. So when it comes time to try to like, you know, bootstrap something, like who's pitching in and how are we going to all do this together? It's, it's, it seems like something really cool. So I, I don't have like a specific – right now it's just – the educational system, but maybe I need to streamline it more. I think I'm just trying to figure it out. What yeah. if it could be like, what if, what if most teachers or a, uh, let's say a, a, a sizable minority, let's say 25% of teachers thought the same way about education that you do they don't. and not in terms of having all of the same opinion, uh-huh. but having the same approach to learning and critical thinking. How would we, how would we get there? Because obviously having that many people out there or whatever that number is, I'm, I'm pulling a number out of the air. Yeah. Um, the 25%, how do we get more teachers? And I'm sure that there are a lot of people out there that have, have a similar story to yours and have been wondering the same things. How do I bring this up to the principal? Are they going to allow me mm-hmm. to teach the kids this way? There are probably a lot of people struggling with those same kinds of things and wrestling with them. I hope so. I mean, I'm working with the heterodox Academy um, so we have a discussion group for educational advocates and teachers and administrators, but it's, it's a slow go. Education is not focused on critical thinking right now. They're just not, they're focused on, sorry, but they're focused on social justice movements and things like that. They're focused on, um, you know, equity movements and not focused on critical thinking. And it's, it's frustrating. It's not that I don't, you know, support the ideas behind social justice at the ideas and what teachers think it is. I'm all in what it actually is. I am not a fan. And, um, and I'm worried about, I'm worried about that is taking away from, from good education. I think there are teachers that once they are exposed to the stuff I'm talking about and other teachers in that heterodox Academy group and stuff, I think it'd be great, but it's, they, you gotta, you gotta break them out a little bit. You know what I mean, Adam? Like, like if you're an open-minded person, I talked about this with Reed a little bit on the podcast about epistemology. It's like he was raised Southern Baptist and then, he though, became an atheist. And in that, he got that feeling of like, oh, what's real? What's up from down? All that kind of stuff. I, get, I just got to start questioning everything. I went through it. 
when moved out here and met my wife, like we kind of need to do that to a lot of people who aren't already looking. I think mm. there has to be some sort of, I don't know, birth into this, this way of thinking for right. it to get anywhere. Right. Well, I think one of the things that makes somebody open to a, wanting to learn a new idea is to realize that there's a crack in their current line of thinking. And so mm -hmm. in that sense, they're like looking for a, a boat that's another, a better ideology that's not sinking to hop into. And that's when people change their minds is when they see the problem of their own thinking. And at the same time, right then, there's a better opportunity presented to them. So me, I'm coming at this from a theological background. You know, you have, you have law and you have grace. It's a law to the proud and grace to the humble. So if somebody thinks he's got everything together, the best thing that he needs is basically somebody to crack him over the head with how he's wrong. And then you're right there to say, Hey, I've got a better, I've got a better idea for yeah. you. But for the people that already know that their ideas have problems, those are the easy people to talk to because then they're seeking and they're looking for a new and better idea. So Will, what's your Instagram handle? If anybody wants to follow you or learn more about your ideology and your goals and mission, where would they go to find you? Yeah, thanks. Uh, it's um, Will Roosh, W-I-L-L-R-E-U-S-C-H. And the podcast is Cylinder Radio. I would love to do this again. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Will. It's been a pleasure talking to you. All the best.